grab switch from the Geo Collective. And thank you for joining us tonight. We have a lot of people attending. And um, let's get started. Um, so the Geo Collective was founded in 1991. The Grassroots Economic Organizing Collective is committed to promoting an economy and society that are just, fulfilling, sustainable, and democratic. GEO's mission is to chronicle, connect, convene, and catalyze activities regarding movements that promote workplace democracy and democratic coordination of the larger economy. We see profiteering, wealth extraction, and neocolonialism as substantially underpinning all systems of oppression and underrepresentation. We see participatory democracy and local and regional economic self-determination as the natural and empowering paths forward for us all. And Everyone, I'm Ade. Um, I think the music you were hearing earlier wasn't too great, but I put the link in the chat in case you're interested in hearing what you couldn't hear. Um, I go, I use they and them pronouns, and I'm so excited to gather tonight with this amazing group of panelists to really water our senses towards the critical imperative of abolition work, especially as it's cultivated in solidarity with the First Peoples and Indigenous Nations of Turtle Island and beyond. I am beaming in from the lands of Okanichi Band of the Saponi Nation in an area we've come to call North Carolina. Um, and the five bands of the Saponi Nation are the past, present, and future stewards and caretakers of this land. Um, we invite you to type in the names of the indigenous lands that you are calling in from um, in your screen name. And to kind of launch us into this discussion, I thought it'd be appropriate to share um, a short poem by Shonda Buchanan, professor, poet, and author of Black Indian, a memoir, um, and Who's Afraid of Black Indians, a book of poetry. And this poem is called The Trail. Um, okay, we have screen share. The trail. These are the holes that fill you up. A morning after 4th of July. The empty hollow, a memory in the fire. The quiet morning rises. Death of father, suicide of a nephew, addiction of sister. Another nephew at war, his brother prison. Pummeling of a mother and aunts. The breaking of lives without a sound. No honor in their deaths or mistakes, no memory of them except here. These are the shimmering calcified minutes, the spotted ghosts of a black Indian's Midwest life where nothing and everything changed. In the fires that burned your farmhouses down, you wonder how you would have been or grown, how you would have loved had not this or this happened. I remember another July, years past, under the glass of time, when we were all together, laughing, spit polished by hard love, smoky with hunger for the future, when memory was a thing yet to come. So that was by Shonda Buchanan from her book of poetry, um, Who's Afraid of Black Indians? Thank you so much for being here, everyone. You're muted. 2020 has been a hell of a year for us all. Um, we have been dealing with multiple pandemics. We have people struggling to breathe, whether it's police violence, or wildfires out west, or economically, and, um, and with COVID-19. We, we wanted to bring 
this great panel together tonight to talk about the ways that cooperatives and abolition work can work together. Policing itself can be a defense of property and power and cooperatives are, help us imagine another way to um, see power, um, to reimagine how communities can um, find alternatives to policing and, and other matters. We have co-ops that are in every sector of the economy, we have worker co-ops, producer co-ops, and, and consumer cooperatives and multi-stakeholder cooperatives. And, there's, and we believe there's a cooperative solution to everything. Tonight, we wanna to talk about co-ops and abolition work. Yes, and we have the pleasure of an amazing panel of folks who know so much about this intersection. Um, and I, this next session, they'll be introducing themselves. Um, and so to Esteban, Morningstar, Ed, Professor Gordon Nemard, welcome. And thank you for saying yes to this. Um, there's so many people that register, so it's lit. And folks want to hear more and figure out how to live into this intersection. Um, so we will start with you, Jessica, for introductions. If you could um, share about who you are and describe your journey of becoming a cooperative abolitionist. Um, and how has that shaped what cooperatives and abolition mean to you? Thanks. Good evening, everybody. Um, I too want to acknowledge the original stewards of the land. I think I'm on Lenape land at the moment. Um, I also want to bring my ancestors into the room with us and remember those enslaved, those who continue to labor without just compensation recognizing the struggles as Abe uh, reminded us and a day, uh, the struggles of all those combating anti-black racism, patriarchy, police brutality. Let's acknowledge the movement for black lives um, and all of our work for um, environmental justice and real, uh, the end of exploitation. So Jessica Gordon Emhart is my name. I'm a political economist professor of community justice and social economic development in the Department of Africana Studies at John Jay College, which is part of City University of New York. I'm a mother and a grandmother. I'm the author of a book called Collective Courage, a history of African-American cooperative economic thought and practice. I'm a co-op educator and a co-op activist. Um, as well as a social activist. Um, to get to the core of the question, why am I a cooperative abolitionist? Um, partly it's because um, I was raised by social activists and continue to believe that um, we need to be, we need to be the transform, we need to transform the society because it's not the kind of society that human beings should live in. And as I started talking, researching about how to use cooperatives for community economic development, and then uh, became an expert, expert in the black co-op movement and African-American cooperatives, uh, the next frontier for looking at co-ops and marginality is to look at co-ops in uh, with incarcerated people in prisons and how to use co-ops for community-based approaches to justice. And so the last few years, I've focused on looking at justice-involved people and how co-ops can work with them and what we can do to uh, abolish the prison industrial complex. And I can talk about that more in the next question. Thank you. Thank you so much, glad to have you here. And we'll move right along to, yes, you, Ed. Hi, uh, thank you all so much for inviting me. I'm Ed Whitfield. <clears throat> I'm here in um, 
Clarksdale, Mississippi now. I used to be many years in North Carolina, even though I was born in Arkansas. Um, what all of these places have in common is that they were places from whom the indigenous um, stewards of the land were forcibly and murderously removed um, over a period of hundreds of years. Um, but most recently, where I am now is a place where um, in 1830, in September of 1830, there was signed the Treaty of Dancing Rabbit Creek that led to the removal of tens of thousands of uh, Choctaw people from 11 million acres of land that was then later developed as part of the plantation system in the, uh, in the Deep South. 11 million acres of land that people were forced off of and forced to walk into what was called Indian territory um, <laughs> to settle on land that had also been stolen from some other uh, Native Americans. It's amazing how the US government was able to trade land that they stole from one group of people uh, to somebody else and then um, remove them in that way. This was the first, Dancing Rabbit Creek was the first treaty that was actually putting into effect the Indian Removal Act. Um, so this is a very historic place. Uh, and the legacy of that tragedy continues with us with the gigantic land holdings that I can see all around me where pieces of that 11 million acres of land ended up um, settling into the plantation class that uh, had a whole bunch of land and bunch of folk living on the land desperately before the Civil War. And then after the Civil War, they had a whole bunch of land and a bunch of folk living precariously on that land as well. So not all that much changed. And, uh, the prison abolition thing just makes it very clear that the 13th Amendment guaranteed as it was written that the, the folk in power really weren't done with slavery yet. Um, and so the slavery that maintains itself and is enshrined in the 13th Amendment is part of the unfinished business of abolitionists. Um, and, and I consider myself to be a part of that it's so fascinating once I was listening to a study done by Brown University of Brown's participation in um, slavery and the slave trade. And it became very, very clear that while slavery was physically concentrated in the South at the point, um, follow, particularly following the abolition of the trading that was going on, that the North was intimately involved in the overall slave system by virtue of um, manufactured goods. They made chains, they made shoes, they made all kinds of things to serve the slave, uh, the, the, the world of enslavement and the plantation economy in the South. And I began to think to myself, it was like, how did people do this? It's like, how could people be blind to the incredible injustice? And I asked, well, I wonder, are there similar injustices around me now that people are almost similarly blind to? And it immediately became clear that the US prison system was such a thing where we, almost tell jokes about the ongoing rape and degradation of humans behind these bars, as though the humans who are, are, are trapped in those places are fundamentally different from the normal humans who end up serving as prison guards and as corrupt politicians and all of the other criminal elements that we're surrounded with daily who are not behind those bars. And it became very, very clear to me that uh, that we have to collectively create the institutions that replace and abolish that institution once and for all. And that our, our proclivity toward developing cooperative solutions should move us one toward creating financial and economic structures that help prevent anyone having been in, in the sense of desperation that leads them to some of the activities that get people into prison including innocent activities like drug trading that's uh, way illegal for no particularly good reasons, um, as well as even other kinds of things. But we have to create community institutions to replace that. We have to create community opportunities for the people who are locked up in, and trapped in that system. So as they get out, they can become the full participating uh, members of the community that they need to be and build the democracy that we deserve that is humane in the ways that we deserve. And I think that it's rooted in the kinds of, of economic development that the cooperative movement represents. Thank you so much. Um, Esteban? 
Hi. Um, I'm excited to be here too. And, and thank you, Ed, um, for, I think it's really important that we um, not sanitize the brutal history of, of uh, settler colonialism. Um, so I, I very much appreciate Ed bringing that um, front and center. I'm, I'm beaming in from Lenny Lenape land. I grew up in Lenape land um, known as New York and I was born and raised there. My people come from uh, Arawak land in, in the Caribbean and I'm, I'm now on Lenny Lenape land in Philadelphia. And it's really exciting to me to see the indigenous names of, of all the places I've lived. Um, like people beaming in from Ohlone and Washtenaw land and um, all parts of, of the world. Um, I should say a couple of things about introduction and then I'm really interested in digging into this question about abolition. Um, and it's interesting that we have the, the pleasure of having this conversation together because we've, um, many of us as colleagues and cooperative organizers have had a lot of com conversations about um, our futures, about reparations, about cooperative development, about black liberation. And this question undergirds that and is, is so rarely given the central place that it needs when we're, when we're envisioning um, our futures. So yeah, my name is Esteban or Esteban um, and I am a cooperative organizer, uh, an educator, not just a cooperative educator, but a political educator. Um, and one of the, you see probably in the Zoom, one of my affiliations is with uh, a worker co-op that I co-founded uh, in 2010 after the US Social Forum called AORTA, which stands for Anti-Oppression Resource and Training Alliance. And um, I also am the executive director for the US Federation of Worker Co-ops. And um, those, are, uh, those are two of my political homes um, as my workplaces, my primary workplaces, but of course, um, so much of my abolition work is outside of, of those places, less so with Aorta. I think we've done more of it around political education and, and resourcing the groups that are on the front lines of um, raising consciousness and awareness about abolition work or um, that are actively, actively doing this, like actively decarcerating. Um, and in fact, I couldn't possibly enter this conversation without giving a shout out to my, my dear friend, comrade, and co-founder of Aorta, uh, Lydia Pello Hobbs, who left, I think, a year ago today, <laughs> who, who transitioned from Aorta and is now a professor. Um, her scholarship is exactly around this work of abolition. Um, she is based in um, New Orleans in, in the South and, um, and is the the um in my time as a graduate student at the city university of new york um i i actually started there studying capitalism and eventually racial capitalism um and then recruited lydia to come on in uh shortly after ruth wilson gilmore had had come to cuny so i actually started there as a student of david harvey um and the late neil smith with these questions about racial capitalism um, and then Ruthie came and it was like, this is the place to be studying this. And, um, and I, I brought Lydia into that work too. And so, so Aort is one of the ways in which people might have known about some of my fingerprints on abolitionist work and organizing and, and um, not just theory, but specifically praxis. Um, and I want to maybe call in some of the other work that I've done about this because my grounding in it is not at all from the cooperative side, actually. And I don't know how much that, that gets um, brought into to our stories of, of particularly this community. Um, and that's why it's a joy to me to, to be able to put those things together in this conversation today. Um, I mean, back back in my deeper organizing history, I've, I've been doing this work through critical, from supporting groups like Critical Resistance, um, the uh, Anarchist Black Cross in the US, in Brazil with uh, Cruz Negra Anarquista, it's the same name, just in Portuguese, um, in my organizing down in Sao Paulo. Um, and uh, I already mentioned my work at the CUNY Graduate Center, uh, more recently supporting along with Ed and, and others, um, the Movement for Black Lives um, and some of that, that sort of angle around what this work looks like. Um, and, uh, and locally in Philly, groups like Decarcerate PA and um, uh, Books Through Bars um, that, 
is working directly to just be in community and resourcing and supporting people who are locked in cages. But over all of that, I mean, my deepest work around abolition and, and community accountability and transformative justice is through a collective that I was part of, volunteer collective um, for 15, 16 years now, um, 10 of which were really intensely focused on, on organizing around transformative justice processes. It was called, um, is, was, eh, we're, not, we're not as active these days, but we haven't disbanded entirely, the Philly Stands Up Collective. And um, we worked um, very, very small collective that worked specifically in holding people accountable who had caused harm in sexual assault situations. Um, and, and in doing so, sharpening our analysis of what it even, like what even is harm and what is accountability. Um, and, and we didn't start, that work didn't even start with um, a refutation of the carceral system. It started with being rooted in our community and meeting the needs of the survivors that were in our community. And then it turned out that we needed to um, just get closer and put the work in, really roll up our sleeves, not just to support the survivors, but that the people who, has, who had caused harm them they, that that actually takes labor that that takes emotional labor to support their work in being accountable in understanding their transgressions um and uh and accompanying them and sometimes that meant that we were doing work around um substance abuse or harm reduction or um some of the other things that i'm sure we'll get into later but um just wanted to call in like that that is my my background really around abolition work is through this collective that actually we started in 2004 and it was before the term transformative justice had been coined by generation five. And of course they had also been doing this work for, for a long time. So those are some of my political homes that I'm sort of bringing in um, to the conversation today. Thank you. Thank you so much. And please Morningstar. Shemisanui, Morningstar Gali, Alakatage Chi'i, Ma'ajumawi is Chi'i. My name is Morning Star Galley. I am Ajumawi Band of Pitt River. I am currently on the lands of the Nishinan, Maidu, and Miwok peoples. Um, we just held an event last night, actually, um, here in Sacramento, California, at Sutter's Fort, um, Abolition with an Indigenous Framework. And it was very powerful to hold the event. Um, at Sutter's Fort, in the rain, uh, in the dark, and to talk about the need for dismantling the carceral system that is known as the United States Empire. Um, and Sutter's Fort, for those that, that are not, may not be aware, Sutter's Fort represents the um, capital of, of genocide for California indigenous peoples, the epitome of genocide. And, and so holding the event there um, and being able to just share our stories and um, share some space with folks without any sort of permissions from anyone um, was just very powerful and very healing. I will share that my um, introduction into cooperatives and my introduction into abolition work um, was really something that I was physically born into. Uh, my father was incarcerated at San Quentin State Penitentiary for seven years. Uh, he was, um, he served seven years for his involvement with Third World Liberation Front movements. And from his release, he, him and my mom were living in the AIM house in Oakland, the AIM for Freedom Survival School. And so that's where I was born. And so having this collectiveness and this this community, <clears throat> excuse me, this community space where uh, we did not rely on on the police and on policing, but very much had an understanding of what it was to be in community and to look out for one another um, is something that I have tried to recreate um, throughout throughout decades within our own communities and, um, and try to, to replicate in knowing that um, there is an interdependency and that is a value system, that it is something that 
we are familiar with um, and not this individualistic um, framework that capitalism um, is constantly um, revealing that, that we are, are continuing to fail at. So I, I'll stop there and thank you so much. It's an honor to be here with all of you. Well, thank you very much. All right, next question we have for the panel is, how do or how can cooperatives serve the abolition movement? And um, Esteban, I'm gonna start with you. Good question. I think first, um, I'm gonna read this like very brief quote from Ruth Wilson Gilmore, which is part of this new, brand new book that came out, uh, Making Abolitionist Worlds. If you're on this webinar, you should get this book. This is, this is the like, dig, dig deep into it, get into it. Um, and it's by our, our uh, or per, what is it published? I'm like produced <laughs> by our, our, our good friends um, at Common Notions. So they're mostly rooted in New York and, and in Philly, um, dear friends of mine. So what Ruth, what I remember, I have to remember to call her Ruth when we're not in just um, intimate friends. Um, what Ruth Wilson Gilmore says is abolition requires that we change one thing, which is everything. When one person says prison abolition, one cannot be talking about only prison. It's building the future from the present in all the ways we can. So that really is kind of the, the jumping off point for me um, on this question. And I think uh, it's interesting. I don't think that cooperatives, and uh, I'm, I'm interested in some of these ways, but I don't actually see cooperatives as like the right from the front kind of solution of like just add co-ops. Um, but I can unpack a little bit about why and, and, and how they figure in. Um, I think that cooperatives as a, as an adjective, as opposed to cooperatives as a noun, really are the way forward for thinking about a post-carceral world and thinking about abolition. Um, uh, in terms of co-ops, which we can talk about in a moment, but in terms of co-ops themselves, I think it get, it's, it's, co-ops are a useful resource or asset when we're thinking about building a theory of power to get our people, our communities, what we need in order to get out of all of this mess. Right. So when we talk about community control, um, even something as basic as just a dignified job or a, a welcoming job, one that's accessible for people who might be formerly incarcerated or currently incarcerated, which Jessica, I'm sure will speak to, um, that these are all things that where, wow, it's really useful to have a, an institution, right, a cooperative enterprise, a cooperative business um, that can go things go about the business of running a business in a different way that can show the way that it's possible to do um, business without playing into all of the um, all of the sort of tripwires of racial capitalism, that there's a different way we can organize uh, work, the future of work, um, workplaces that are free of harm or that have different kinds of policies that show what it looks like to hold people accountable and not just say, you messed up, you're fired, or you messed up, we're calling the police. Not just inside of the workplaces, but for those of us who, who run work, workplaces that, um, that have a public interface, whether that's retail-based or otherwise, where we're actually dealing with the community, it's not just, hey, there's this person loitering outside the store, um, let's call the cops. It's like, we actually need to have and show the way for a whole new set of systems for what it looks like um, to address that, to be... Um, to, to not shutter ourselves off from the community, but to acknowledge that like we are, we're, we're existing in a context, we're operating cooperative businesses in a context. And so what's useful about cooperatives is that we have a um, set of cooperative principles um, and intentions and the people behind it who are accountable, right? Like I think that cooperatives have been able to come up with better internal and public facing policies for how to operate, not because we're so wonderful and good, but just because we're always transparent and we got our business out paraded in front of everybody. Like people will drag you on Twitter for being unprincipled or unaccountable um, or for having a bad experience. And so I think that that becomes um, kind of the hard way of, of showing that there's um, that there's a different way to go about um, business, to use and leverage um, economic power, 
um, to even come together as things like a chamber of commerce or with the federation, uh, the worker co-op federation, like to actually put our, our thumb on the scale of advocacy to say, okay, if we're legalizing cannabis, what does a just transition look like with that economy? We will show you the way of how to develop these businesses, how to set up licensing and permitting. Um, and, and the reason why it needs to be not just a good idea or an alternative or a thing that you set up on the side, but there is no just way of legalizing the cannabis industry without actively uh, um, addressing the harm of you've been locking up our people for 40, 50, 60 years. So we need to address all of that stuff. I think that co-ops um, as sites of organizing can show the, the, the way um, to do that. And um, Jessica? Yes, um, following up on Esteban, I think um, what I call the solidarity cooperative value systems and principles and practices are also what can help here, right? The, the, the principle of self-help and self-determination, democratic participation, community ownership or own, you know, broad ownership, um, even the conflict transformation that, right, and conflict resolution skills that we need to develop in order to be good cooperators. So I think the principles and then the way that people in cooperatives practice those principles um, can be very helpful to the abolition movement because part of the issue, right, about decarceration, abolition, et cetera, is how do we treat each other, right? How else can we treat each other, right? All we know is the individualistic violence, right, of the society that we're in. But actually, we do know how to treat each other better. We do it in our, usually in our families, not always, and we do it mostly in cooperatives, though some cooperatives struggle with it also. But I think, right, reaching into those, that pocket of values and principles and practices from the cooperative movement. And again, I always like to say the solidarity cooperative movement, because that really focuses on in, us in on those kinds of humane, human principles of interaction, right? So if we, if we combine what we learn from being in those systems with, as um, Esteban already said, with the practices of being in uh, in co-ops that have ad already addressed some of the root problems, right? So I also see that, right, if we think about um, health and mental health issues as being a problem, well, more health co-ops are addressing health issues through cooperative and community systems, right? If um, lack of education or lack of dignified work or lack of work is a problem, right? Worker co-ops, worker control over employment, um, you know, better community-based education, right, will also address some of those root problems. Um, addiction services that are done in a cooperative way. We see it, the social co-op movement in um, Northern Italy and other places around the world really have already shown us that you can address so many of the things that we just lock people up for through cooperative ownership and cooperative structures makes, makes a difference. And so I think it's, it's the, the practices that we have that we can that we can um, share with the movement, both as how to operate together and as how to solve some of the root problems that cause our society to say we need, right? We 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 need to lock people up and we need to have zero tolerance and that kind of thing. So to break that cycle by addressing the systemic issues, but addressing them through the um, the value systems that we have in the co-op movement. Oh, thank you. Um, Ed. Yeah, uh, I appreciate what, um, what everyone is, has been saying. Um, the emphasis that Esteban puts on um, the fact that cooperatives aren't a magic bullet solution to everything. In fact, they may not be in and of themselves a magic bullet solution to anything. Um, but they are arenas of organizing. They're sites, they're locations of, of organizing. And what we are organizing is an alternative to an inhuman, dehumanizing system that elevates profit above everything else. It makes profit sacred and everything else is a tool for ex enhancing and expanding profit. Um, so that which is actually sacred is taken to be instrumental and that which ought to be instrumental 
is held as being sacred and it's pretty well um, bass awkward as, as we say. Um, I also really appreciate what, um, what uh, Jessica Gordon Nimhart is saying about the values of the, the same, very same cooperative values are really, really important values in building the kind of community that we want to see. Um, and, you know, stressing that building our community to be what it needs to be is about building in, and creating institutions. We can't simply oppose existing dysfunctional institutions. We actually have to build the functional ones. And a lot of folk um, get hung on that. It's like, you know, you talk about get rid of someone, what you're going to replace it with. And so much of our work has to do with creating, and it's it's not as glamorous as, I don't know, it's not as much fun as tearing down stuff uh, when you have to start building stuff. Because you can tear down stuff really, really quick, tear down a whole wall, but then when you build it back, it goes up a brick at a time. And um, so we have to be prepared for the, the, the brick at a time construction of the new systems, even as we're adamant about um, tearing down the old ones. Um, what cooperative movement is about is in every sphere, sphere of development, in jobs, in, in, in healthcare, in, uh, in community services, uh, in every sphere of, of development in society, we have to replace the domination of capital. Uh, we have to replace that with the elevation of human needs um, meeting needs and, and, and elevating the quality of life, um, elevating the standard of living within community to match our growing you know, needs and aspirations. This has to replace the kind of simplistic expansion of, uh, expansion of profit as a motivating factor. And so our cooperative movement in every arena of its work elevates that argument. So whether we're building worker co-ops or we're building grocery store co-ops or we're building housing cooperatives, um, we have to do the organizing work to put people together to construct those social and economic systems that meet our needs. Um, and in doing so, we render irrelevant some of the anti-humane and inhuman structures that people have put before us as the only possible alternative. In other words, part of why prisons exist is folks say, well, of course you have to have prisons because like what else you can do with all these crooks? Well, we employ a substantial number of crooks in running the government. So maybe we could expand government services and we got lots of stuff we can do with crooks. But, but more seriously, um, the things that drive people into criminal activity when it's actually criminal activity, a huge amount of stuff drives people into prisons. I mean, we have to remember that the history of the modern prisons is connected with finding a way to re-enslave a portion of the population who had just been, been, um, been granted a nominal freedom. And it, it was a real effort to make sure that these folks were still available to do slave labor. So many, many people who were caught up in that system have been caught up in that system for no reason other than the fact that, that um, the folks did not want to do away with slavery and maintain the institution to do that. Some other people have engaged in antisocial behavior, but my bet is that all of us do at some points or the other, and only some of us are in prison. So, um, so what we have to do is we, we have to create structures that allow for people to make mistakes and come back into community. And, and this is about uh, again, elevating the values, the cooperative values um, of self-determination, self-reliance, uh, transparency, honesty, um, fair distribution of the, the products of human labor. All of these things have to be at a core, at, at the root of the kind of society we want to build. And then a whole lot less people would find a need to engage in uh, antisocial behavior. And those who, who do, we need to find a way to reintroduce them into community and, and, and as the productive people that they're capable of being. All of this is the elevation of the values that we inside the cooperative movement expound. Thank you. Uh, Morningstar. Sure, um, I just 
dropped a couple of links there. One is the you, We Keep Us Safe 916, um, the Instagram page, and there's a couple other social media pages. Um, so this is a 12-week political education series that um, has been autonomously organized here within the Sacramento area. And so the series um, in terms of indigenous sovereignty and abolition within indigenous framework, that's um, what we have been, uh, been participating in along with um, community uh, safety and community defense um, programs. And I also dropped a link to um, the land that was returned by the Rapid City Council uh, to the local Lakota tribal peoples and organizations um, where 1200 acres will be returned. And so I think that that's really um, can be a starting place is that there's this whole movement of land back and stolen land back and, and water back. And so what does it mean to really hold some sort of accountability for that, that, you know, if we're talking about sheltering our unhoused relatives, if we're talking about, you know, having, um, building those deep relationships within, within our communities, that it can start in terms of, of um, creating spaces and creating those alternatives, not only to the carceral system, but also to what is it that, that we are envisioning and what we, um, our envisioning is this collectiveness within our communities, a collective framework of how to just um, be, you know, be back in community with one another. And I think that, you know, especially after there has been so much destruction over these past four years, um, I moved away from my tribal community, knowing that where I lived within Northeast California at the time that this was all of my um, children's, you know, school teachers, this was their educators, these were my neighbors that had all uh, voted, you know, in, in extremely high numbers. Um, and so, and out of the fear of that, knowing that being in, you know, back in urban areas um, was a lot safer for, for myself and my family at the time. And so I think that, you know, we're just going to have to um, continue that in terms of the safety of one another, um, in terms of dismantling the prisons and systems of policing. Um, and, and, you know, what is like, the question earlier about values, like for, we know that for indigenous peoples that we did not, you know, that we had strict rules in terms of banishing people or in terms of um, not tolerating, um, you know, the way that, that um, in, I think it really came down to holding people accountable, right? And so holding each other accountable, holding our communities accountable for our own safety and for, um, the security of our, of our collective um, future generations. And so I think that when we talk about what it is that we can, can envision and what it is that we can go forward in, um, that it really starts with those traditional values, with that grounding of who we are and being able to, to move forward with that. Wow, this has been such a rich conversation so far. Um, one question we would love to hear from y'all, and unfortunately these responses will have to be a little shorter because we're almost out of time, um, but what qualities of abolition work would you say aren't showing up in, co in the cooperative space and vice versa? Can I? Oh, go for can, it. can I jump in with, because it kind of bridges to what is showing up and what isn't showing up. And sometimes yeah. they're the same thing because yes. co-ops aren't a monolith. Like some of <laughs> us are a decade ahead of what other of us are still catching up about. Um, and, and I think it bridges to this question of like, all right, what's up? What's up? How can co-ops help with abolition? Um, so I will bridge that by saying first, I think... Um, there are some pretty direct and material things around just like what is your cooperative business plan that could or should meet the needs um, of, of people 
people who are survivors, because that's a huge part of the carceral system, is like the way that that gets weaponized often, but also just like that that's a need. If we're envisioning a world without prisons, we got to talk about the people who are the survivors of harm, um, but certainly also the people who've caused harm. Um, and all the bystanders, which like often gets left out of the conversation. And I, I've only learned this like, you know, 10 years into doing, um, well now, 15 years into doing this work more and more that like we got to zoom out and start considering like there's all these people who are like yo i'm activated in this now because like now i have a feeling about like you stole her such and such and so like now i feel less safe or now i feel like i gotta lock my stuff up or i feel like you're not listening to my voice unless you're adhering to my demand that this person is chased out of town and blah blah, blah right so we have some stuff to do um there's some things we can be doing there's there are cooperatives right now um, in many of the places you live that uh, provide safer spaces, that deal with mental health, that deal with spiritual health, that deal with physical health. I mean, yoga, acupuncture, uh, herbalism, like all kinds of things, uh, fitness centers, many of them are, are actually offering um, free or discounted participation in their, their programs or their services, um, just in solidarity with Black and Indigenous people. Um, and I think certainly could or should consider being like, oh, you're formerly incarcerated, free coffee, free whatever. Like that there's way there are ways that we can just bake that into our plan and show our politics um, in that way. Uh, I think that ties to mutual aid as a higher principle of something that we're already really good at. And we saw this in like in stereo, um, especially in the spring in March, April, May, um, in light of the pandemic, where people were like, normally we run a bookstore. Now we're a food hub because people ain't got food and they're not leaving the, na the immediate neighborhood. Like this is what we're living with. So we fully have, and that's just the existing capital, not even speaking to what is the cooperative uh, network that we're building that's like in the pipeline that's under development and that needs to be resourced when we talk about divestment and reinvestment um so all of those things are there um one more macro thing and then a like cultural thing the macro thing when we talk about defunding the police um abolishing the carceral state um and it was like so joyous to see the level of sophistication where we finally saw people who I'm sure self-identified as allies move through a moment of being like, oh, there's a, this many billions of dollars that we're paying into the active harm of our own people. And we could literally be like, oh, there are 12 people on this city council or there's this many people at the county or the state level. We can take those that money and just the same thing that we're actively replenishing year after year and move it into the things that we need to feed ourselves, to house our people, to clothe our people, let alone the social services, the mental health services. When it gets down to it, let's talk, let's map out like where, where is incarceration even coming from? What are we locking people up for? Half of this stuff shouldn't be cr criminalized in the first place. So it's really helpful to say, yeah, show up at the polls, turn out the vote, maybe not because of a candidate for president or for senator, but literally there were ballot initiatives all up and down in all the places y'all live that are like community oversight board for the police, defunding them, setting up these kinds of commissions. What does it look like to reinvest in some of these community um, councils and uh, mental health services and recognizing that so many of the folks that are in harm's way and or who get locked up and swept up in the system, it's because we're not funding our goddamn schools. It's because we don't have any mental health services. It's also because our own communities don't have a level of cultural tolerance for people who are problematic in one way or another. So it gets right back at the like, if we're talking about abolition, it means like, yeah, we have to have a little more nuance than being like, you're either canceled or you're woke. It's like people cause harm all the time. And I think that is one of the lessons that we can show in cooperatives, which is like, you're an owner, you're a co-owner of a business. Sorry that I'm like overly attributing this to worker cooperatives, but like, that's my political home nowadays. <laughs> I've been involved in all kinds of other cooperatives and I'm like, this is the, this is the, the special sauce. You're unprincipled. You did this thing. Like, it doesn't mean that you're going to agree all the time to Ed's point. Like, it's not now you got a co-op, there's democracy. It's the solution. It's like, no, no, no. When you get in there, you realize, oh yeah, you're in this and you're disagreeing with people. What does it mean to disagree with folks? It means that like we have figured out 
processes, a culture, mechanisms for being in principal disagreement with each other. And sometimes the stretch of that is not just disagreement like you think we should invest in a new walk-in fridge and you think that we should spend our money in raising wages or whatever. Sometimes it's actively like this dude caused harm. <laughs> Like my people don't feel safe or so-and-so said something that is not in alignment with our movement principles. And we don't think that they should be in our space or that they should be representative um, of our movements. How do you grapple with that without just being like you're banished and excommunicated? That's the work that we did in Philly stands up. That's why we pivoted from being necessarily like doing like the active conflict, you know, harm reduction stuff to doing Ed, political education around transformative justice. I mean, just like gorgeous things that are coming out of, op-eds in the New York Times from our homie Mariam Kaba, from people who are, you know, getting into this, the work of what it really looks like to hold people accountable in a way that has nothing to do with litigators, uh, arbitration, judges, courts, certainly not cops, police, and prisons, to actually deal with the source of the harm. And it means that we're returning to indigenous practices of not kicking people out. So it's taking the principle of restorative justice that I think already exists in basically all cooperatives and amping that all the way up to transformative justice, which is zooming out and saying, what are all of the things about the circumstances and situation that need to be changed, including our social relationships? And that's where I think we're, we, are not, we are not the model or the example, but we have a structure and an institution that's binding us together, where we have to make collective decisions, where we have a certain amount of trust, and where I think we could start to show the way of what it looks like to, hold, to principally hold people accountable for their harm and address it. Um, that's good. You're going to see that in schools. You're going to see that in um, sometimes in nonprofits, in all kinds of different institutions, collectives um, that aren't even incorporated and structured are already doing this. So all of those, I think, start to show the way of what it looks like to take skills of group governance, not just around like harm or accountability, but even lighter things of like, how do you make collective decisions? What does accountability look like? Not because you caused harm, but like because you forgot to lock the front, like just basic things. Like what are the things you were meant to do? Co-ops are very practiced in this stuff. Very, very practiced in that stuff. And I think that we should be sharing those skills with our, with our community members. Yes, um, would love to hear from you, Morningstar, if you have anything you want to add or um, kind of pick up from there. Yeah, all of that was great. I would just add, you know, that in, um, in utilizing decolonization and autonomy um, as, you know, as, as these forms of of tearing down these carceral systems. Um, I think that, you know, there's, there's a legacy of resistance that has, that's been my, my personal model that has been um, just my lived experience. I do want to acknowledge and recognize there's, there's an elder on the call here this evening, um, Urban Res Life. Urban Res Life was a child um, on Alcatraz Island during the occupation over 50 years ago. Um, and so I just want to acknowledge that and, and just say that, um, you know, in recognizing when, when I think of abolition, you know, it, it's just like the picture that I have in my mind is, is this island of Alcatraz and how Alcatraz was this former prison and how the native peoples that occupied Alcatraz um, were able to transform it and to say like, yes, there's this history of confinement and our own peoples being confined on the island, but to transform it into recognizing the lack of running water, the lack of heat, the lack of um, employment on the island was very much modeled. At, after US reservations. And so they made that stand, that 19 month stand and in occupying the island and they created a school on the island. The educators created a school called the Little Red Schoolhouse. And that schoolhouse was one that I attended as a child and that my children then attended after I did. And so I just think of these models and this reimagining of everything that Esteban just, just mentioned and, and Ed and Jessica, 
as well. And, and just thinking of like, what is possible and what is it that, um, we are recreating and absolutely in addressing harm within our communities, um, addressing, you know, the centering of survivors in, in all of this and recognizing that, um, that we were over, we've overcome a lot of trauma in that, and that, um, you know, we are figuring it out as we go in terms of healing ourselves individually and healing our communities collectively. Um, I just want to say very briefly, uh, the cooperative movement is again, it's, a, it's an arena of struggle that contains all of the problems and all of the virtues uh, of any other arena. And so, you know, we live in a racist society. So you have racism inside cooperatives. Uh, we live in, in a individualistic capitalist oriented society. You have tendencies toward that inside cooperatives. For cooperatives are different is that they, they do not elevate to the level of principle um, the elevation of profit over human life. Um, and they do make meeting needs something that is central to a group of people getting together to collectively do so. All of the different kinds of ways we can mess that up, we do. And we have to, it's an ongoing and continuous struggle to find ways to do it right. But at least we're trying to do the right thing. And we have to continue to do that. And again, in building this world in which prisons are not, um, are not thought to be needed. I believe they're not needed now, but they're thought to be needed. But in building a world where they're not thought to be needed and where people have a, a, an opportunity to full expression of their humanity, their creativity, their energy, um, without doing anything that's gonna land them in a place where they're locked away from society. In building that, we have much to learn from the effort that we're putting into the cooperative system, even though, again, much of it suffers from the same struggles that we suffer from in all the other arenas. Yeah, let me just add, um, this is a fabulous conversation. Um, I wanted to add on both sides. So what I think, you know, the cooperative movement can actually learn from the abolitionist movement is a couple things. Um, one is the insidiousness of anti-blackness and then and the need to address, you know, to address and eliminate, ab abolish anti-blackness, right? Um, the abolitionist movement forces us to remember that and to remember, right, as we said, that even the 13th Amendment, which abolished enslavement, didn't really abolish racism. It didn't abolish incarceration or, in, or slavery during incarceration, any of those kinds of things. I think another thing that we, um, we all learn, and especially the, the co-op community can also learn um, from abolition is the notion of state violence, right? And to understand structural systemic problems, issues, uh, violence and inequality because also it's really easy to focus on behavior and individual people doing something or not doing something. And even again, co-ops suffer from doing that, focusing more on the individual, even though right, we're supposed to be a collective and whatever. Um, the abolitionist movement helps us to remember right, that people's individual behavior is just a tiny little piece of what's going on. It's really the structural systemic um, systems in our society that you know that are that need to be addressed and and that we can't solve the problems of society without looking and solving those um esteban brought up um i think he didn't name it victimization but the victimization movement which i believe has also come out of the abolitionist movement my daughter actually isn't is a victim a victimologist meaning she studies uh, criminology and crime from the perspective of society as the victim. And what does that mean for restoration and problem solving, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that's another thing that the abolitionist movement has, right? That's part of understanding state violence, right? That they're all, we're all actually victims, even the so-called criminals. And how do we address that? How do we re- organize and re, you know and restore ourselves from that perspective instead of blaming other people right analyzing the systems um, 
So I think those kinds of things we get from abolition will help the co-op movement, but also just help all of us as human beings. As we all keep saying, even the co-op movement is really just to get us closer to human perfectibility, right? To, to achieving well-being and our humanness to the extent that we can, especially through economic systems. So even co-ops aren't the end all, the be all, whatever. Um, but on the other hand, I do want to just mention quickly, because I know we're ready for Q&A, um, some of the research I've been doing about how um, allowing incarcerated people to form their own worker co-ops while still in prison is, an, to me, a move toward um, decarceration and, and abolition, right? Because it, it um, helps to put an end to slave labor, other indignities, and lack of control over income and control over work and control over product, right? That happens in prison as well as in our regular system. Um, and there's good results. Uh, Mekele prison in Ethiopia has been doing incredible stuff with um, incarcerated worker co-ops and connecting these co-ops with micro lending programs that are right on site, allowing even um, released uh, people uh, to stay in their co-op so they still have work and have a job and have that camaraderie once they're out. The camaraderie and the social capital and the leadership development that happens um, even while you're in prison, if we had more of them would be a way, I think, to figure out how to change even what the nature of what prison is like, right? We know that um, the people that we've interviewed who have been in prisons, especially I, I, I had interviewed some people from the um, uh, Cooperative Aragos in Puerto Rico in one of the prisons there. And when they talk about the experience, right, of belonging, of making their own decisions, of working with other people, of making enough income to help their families, all that kind of thing really helps to transform what could happen and how we treat right, how we actually treat um, people behind bars. So I think there's that, um, oh, the give and take, not give and take, what is it, the exchange, right, that uh, abolition and co-op movement or the movement for a dignified work or whatever, right, there's ways that, there's so many ways that we can interface what we learn and what we know from each of those movements and come up with, a, you know, a really beautiful new system and future that we'd all be happy to be a part of and that would um, address all the issues that we've all been talking about and create some of the societies that I think um, we've been hearing from Morningstar about, right? Um, uh, the, how our ancestors have, have, have viewed and tried to, tried to create societies on a better way. Yes. Wow, wow, wow. Uh... I'm sure that's what everyone is thinking. <laughs> um, so we only have a couple moments left and we do wanna get to some Q and A. We have a couple questions from the audience. And before we do that, um, you know, there's this saying that we are our ancestors' wildest dreams. And so in the spirit of futuring ourselves and thinking about these next seven generations, what would you say are y'all's wildest dreams um, in terms of this cooperative abolitionist work. Um, and then we'll move into audience questions. Um, so we'd love to start with you, Morningstar. Sure. Um, when I think of wildest dreams and what Jessica was just mentioning um, in terms of, of how we treat people behind bars, um, it brings me back to, um, I was in, in college, attending a private college and volunteering on the weekends at FCI Dublin, the nearby federal correctional institution um, with their native and, and spiritual programming. And so I would walk out of this college uh, environment where no one looked like me and then walk into um, a federal correctional institution where everyone looked like me and would spend my weekends there and just spend my time, um, you know, sitting in circles and praying and talking with them and, you know, and walked out extremely um, heavy um, on, 
on the heart and mind in knowing that, you know, from young, young youth that were tried as adults to grandmothers um, that were there, you know, um, away from, from their grandchildren and so many that may not ever be able to hold their children again. So that's part of why, and a, a good reason why um, I continue the advocacy that I do and to ensure that um, all peoples deserve to live free of bars and free of cages and um, be in community and in spaces with their, their loved ones. Um, and so that's, that's the big dream, right? That's the big goal um, and what we work towards and what we fight towards every day. Yeah, let's popcorn it. Um, Esteban, yes, please. I can go next. Um, I'm not gonna do the co-op one. I'm gonna do the, the sort of like process culture answer, which is, you know, my, my dream is we're not, utopia is not a world without harm. Like that's just, that's not, that's not what we're doing. We've all, we've all been the people who transgressed, who didn't understand, who messed up. Um, and so my, my big vision is one where everyday people have skills. It's just like part of our culture to know how to communicate, <laughs> whether that's in your personal relationship. We all have family that gets on our damn nerves. Like, what does it look like to have skills to move through that? Not to be like wave a wand and it's never going to happen. What does it look like to have more spaciousness, compassion, empathy, facilitation, de-escalation, conflict resolution to work with that? Because guess what? There is no world without prisons unless we have those skills embedded in everyday people and communities. This is not, you're not putting your problems just like call a order to solve your problem or to mediate the conflict, right? Like that's not what, or call your rabbi. That is not how we're getting through this. We're getting through this when our communities have the capacity and the skills to deescalate some stuff, to, to, to respond differently, not in this black, white, you're innocent, you're guilty, um, you, you're, you're, uh, you're labeled or you're branded by the worst act you've ever done or the, the worst day of, of, um, of your life or the worst behavior you've ever perpetrated. That is not how we're doing this. And of course that needs to be, if we're centering survivors, we're good. If we center black and indigenous people with mental health issues, black and indigenous people with disabilities, black and indigenous people who are queer, trans or non-binary, we're good. We are good. If we can do that, if we can build a world that works for those people, everyone will be totally okay, I promise you. So let's do that. Okay, I'll go next. Um, so a couple things, um, just to be practical, um, GEO having enough money to do a lot more of this work would be great. So please donate to GEO. Um, <laughs> you can go on our website and we have a donate button, be a sustainer so we can do more of this work and, and, and keep on going. I, I think you know that we're a, an organization of volunteers um, and we're working hard. Um, so my future is a world without, I agree we can't be without conflict, but we do need to be a world without um state violence and without a hierarchy and oppression. And so in addition to kind of making sure we all know how to de-escalate and how to um, address conflict and how to make sure that conflict leads us to a better place, not to a, a worse place and doesn't, de you know, doesn't take us down that rabbit hole, right? But I also think we need to be in a place where we, we know how we do, we know how and we resist um, capitalism. I mean, I, I don't think there's any way around it. I think capitalism is one of the worst problems we have because it reinforces all the things that are the root causes of um, people feeling unsafe. Um, and it's because of capitalism that we, you know, uh, that we have poverty and, and uh, that people don't have the right health care, but it's also because of capitalism that we label certain things as 
reasons to be incarcerated for and reasons to be arrested, right? We arrest people, as I think Ed said at the beginning, right? Because we wanted to really maintain enslavement and we believe certain people shouldn't be free. And so we created stupid stuff. Like if you, if you look at any of the laws and it's not just the South, it's the North. New York City had laws where if you could be arrested, if you didn't, if you were a black person and you were out after 8 p.m. at night and you didn't carry a lantern because they wanted to be able to see what you were doing at night, you could be arrested for that, right? So we know that we have, right, all this kind of state violence where you make up things that are, are, that are crimes, right? And you let the people who are doing the real harm to other people, they get off because they're not in some status or category, but um, the people that you don't want, that the, that the 1%, that the people who are running everything don't want to have any rights or to be on the street or whatever, you lock them up. And so until we change that system, until it's not economically beneficial, right, to lock people up, it's not economically beneficial to have some people um, unemployed and some people not to have that, right? If we don't get rid of those kinds of systems, if we don't resist that and say, no, you know, enough is enough, we're never gonna get to the next stage. Um, and so that to me, you know, that's why I kind of like solidarity cooperatives because they, they start us practicing something that's different than that. But the real, right, the real thing we have to do is say enough is enough. This is not how human beings treat each other. This is not how we should live. And this is not how our economic, social or political systems should operate. Um, and luckily we know that there's other ways to do it We've been talking about them tonight, we see them. And so we need to just say, we know how to do this in a different way, let's do it. I'm gonna to try to go talk really, really fast. Uh, to me, I wanna live in a, my wild dreams are to live in a world where everybody is valued and everybody is able to produce value, where we all contribute and we all benefit, uh, where there's adequate food and shelter for everybody uh, at a high quality, where there are beautiful spaces for people to participate in that are common spaces, where the access to the resources and the earth is held in commons for us to benefit, utilize, to create uh, beauty, where we all are trying to create music and poetry and art, and where we have joy daily. Uh, that's my fond dream, and uh, let's do it. Hey, I'm so here for that. I'm like, should we go into a jam session? Close this out. Um, thank you all so much for your brilliance and your time and your excitement, your ideas, just everything. Very grateful to be here with you. And um, yes, all of the participants are as well. So, Malakia and Josh, um, I think, are going to choose a couple questions. Unfortunately, we won't be able to get to all of them, but I hope the chat has been generative and you're finding the answers you need, folks. Um, so, Josh, away. Yeah, um, got a question here from Matthew Epperson. He says, I'm Curious, the panelists' views on the economic and human viability of the IWW phrase, forming the structure of the new world in the shell of the old. Specifically, assuming we abolished racialized capitalism, do you see uh, our current or future cooperative movement being integral to the structure that truly replaces the old structure? Do we need our co-op movement to be integral in that way? Quickly, yes, we are planting the seeds of the new world inside the carcass of the old one as it's dying and decaying around us. And I would just add um, that for me, cooperatives are part of the practice toward the new thing. I'm not sure they're the new thing that we need but they help to move us forward because some of the, so many of the practices that we've been talking about tonight um, help us to move forward to a new place, right? So um, we need something while we're in this carcass, right? And so the co-ops provide us with some kind of structure that get us closer to what we wanna be. And I think co-ops allow us 
to gain the skills that we need to then even transform our society even more. And I would pile on and say that you can't build the new without the old, right? Like we learned this from natural systems, compost, soil, it's all recycling the same materials, right? And so the old world includes people, it includes labor, it includes land, it includes all of these things. The, the, the transformation itself is about seizing those materials, reorganizing them in a different way and repurposing them. It's not different materials. It's not different elements. We're, we're on this planet together, y'all, right? It's organizing them in a totally different way. And so there's no other way forward other than from the shell of the old. Thank you for that. Um, one last question that I'll end this is, for those of us who are starting out, are there any resources or help that could help us start co-ops? I know Esteban was um, answering that in the chat, but I also wanted to add resources for people who are just getting into the abolition movement. Do you guys have anything that you could point them to, to, be like, to books or things of that sort um, for people that are interested in what you guys are talking about? Well, it depends on what your entry point is. I love, I love some black Marxism, the new version. What is it? Rethinking black, black Marxism. Um, um, those are, those are helpful for some of the questions that I've seen coming up in the Q and A. Um, I mentioned um, common notions and the work that they're doing um, around making abolitionist worlds. We have this new book. Um, then I'm in, I love just being able to do this right next to my bookshelf. I'm like, oh, let me show you this. Uh, Beyond Survival, which is a great uh, book. Uh, we have a, the Philly Stands Up Collective. The, one of the pieces I wrote is in here that talks about, it really breaks it down. Like, this is all overwhelming. What if I'm just like trying to deal with like my shitty housemate who won't clean the dishes? It actually gets at some of that. Like, here's a process for dealing with people who cause harm in a like everyday way, not in a, it's your job, you're a social worker, it's your workplace kind of thing, but just like, yo, my cousin is garbage. How do we deal with this? So some of that is in here. Um, and then the stuff that the Barnard Center uh, has been putting on their site, again, this has been coordinated by Mariam Kaba. Um, just all these Vimeos that are, they're doing a drip, 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 releasing little bits at a time. They're digestible. You can use it if you're working with college students, high school students, middle school students, your shitty housemate. <laughs> um, but just like they're short, they're bite-sized. Like what is transformative justice? What is community accountability? What are ways of going about like, uh, uh, uh. it is like the smartest people in the world saying that, well, myself excluded, I think that everyone else on there is smarter than me, um, saying a little bit about like, what does this approach look like from the, from the perspective of the Bay Area Transformative Justice Collective, who someone was shouting out in the comments, um, and some of these other groups, right? So we're digesting it, we're trying to make it more accessible. There's versions with captions, there's versions that are written, there's, right? So that stuff is there. Transform Harm is the best place to start because it kind of maps out who is doing this work in different ways. Um, again, that's less about the cooperative side because we already talked about that, but more about like dealing with accountability, dealing with incarceration and post-carceral organizing. And of course the co-op side, geo.coop. Um, we have a lot of resources and a lot of links. US Federation, what is it? USworker.coop has a lot of information about worker co-ops. Um, so those are places to start to look for co-op development. And also, what is it, ed.coop, is that right, Josh? ed.coop yes. um, for learning about co-op education and co-op development. I thought that was the site that was set up for me, ed.coop, but maybe not. But I'm sorry, I have to run. I'm sorry for not being able to stay for the very ending. Thank you, Ed. Thank you so much. And Morningstar, did you want to add anything to that list? Um, I think it's a great list. I can put a few links in, in the chat also. But, okay. Yeah. Amazing. Well, we give so much thanks and um, just praise y'all's way. Thank you for staying in this struggle um, and continuing to be the cooperative abolitionists that you are and inspiring others to become. I want to live into all of the wildest dreams y'all mentioned. Um, so I'm so here for that. Um, all right. 
Have a good night. Mm. I guess, is that how people end these things? Good night. Good morning. Yeah, you could play that music again and like Ooh, yeah. finger that Thank while people you. trickle out. First, okay. Thank you, Esteban. <laughs> No, I don't have control issues, I swear. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that was a joke from the green room earlier. <laughs> Y'all are beautiful. Thank you so much. This was great. I needed this. <laughs>